Welcome to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher, where we take you behind the scenes with peak performers to learn what makes them tick and discover how you can apply their lessons to your life. I'm your host, Molly Fletcher. The weather's getting warmer, spring training is here, and baseball season is just around the corner. Today, I'm joined by Atlanta Braves shortstop Dansby Swanson, a rising star in the big leagues. A former number one draft pick out of Vanderbilt, Dansby made his big league debut in 2016 for his hometown team, the Atlanta Braves. In 2020, he put together the best season of his young career, hitting 274 with 10 homers and 25 RBI in a shortened season, by the way. Off the field, he is the founder of a lifestyle brand and movement, All Things Loyal, which showcases the culture of Atlanta. In our conversation today, we dig into the mindset of peak performance and the importance of mental health. We explore the techniques like journaling, therapy, and brain spotting that Dansby uses to strengthen his mental game. We also talk about managing pressure, his leadership evolution, and his approach to goal setting. Let's get to it. Here's my conversation with Dansby Swanson. All right, Dansby. Well, it's awesome to have you on. I appreciate you joining. This is going to be fun, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I'm, I'm definitely uh, pleased to be able to have this opportunity. Well, this will be fun. So I want to start here. Right out of high school, you're a 38th rounder, and you took a pass and went on to Vandy. How good was that decision? Uh, I mean, I think it's probably one of the better decisions I've probably made. I mean, I, and just to clarify, I mean, for people like I wasn't really uh, like, highly sought after. I wasn't really highly recruited. Uh, I would say that I was a late bloomer just because I my physical skills hadn't gotten to the point where my like mental skills were um, in high school and everything. I was always a little bit. Uh, overlooked a um, little bit, not necessarily undersized, but I just hadn't, I hadn't focused strictly on baseball. I'd been playing basketball and I was a really good player. Um, I knew the game really well. My dad was pretty much my coach the majority of my life, but just taught me so much about the game and like kind of sees the field in a different light than everybody else and, and all those kinds of things. So mentally, I felt like I was far ahead of everybody else that was around but physically i just wasn't there yet because of the basketball and because you know just hadn't completely grown into my body and so obviously i didn't i wouldn't even say i turned down money or anything out of high school the 38th round thing was more of like a a courtesy draft to like say hey you had your name drafted out of high school more so than i mean even the, the phone call was from a guy's name's alan matthews he was the area scout for the rockies at the time and he was like, I know you're going to Vandy. I just wanted to like basically tell you and congratulate you that we drafted you, uh, you know, in the 38th round just to, for you to be able to say like I was drafted. And he was like, I'll see you in three years. So off to school I went and that was by far the best decision I've made. Well, and Vandy, uh, to your point, was one of the only schools that recruited you, right? I mean, to your point of being a little underrated and overlooked. So Vandy was recruiting me. Um, I actually went on a recruiting trip to Clemson, but even the, the Clemson stuff, it was kind of like, I felt like they kind of got on to the recruiting thing because Vandy was recruiting me and because Corbs, you know, Tim Corbin, for everybody who doesn't know, Tim Corbin's the coach at Vanderbilt and he came from uh, Coach Leggett who was at Clemson. So there's a little bit of a connection there. So I, I do kind of wonder if that played a little bit of a role, um, you know, and, and Clemson starting to recruit me. And then uh, I've been recruited a little bit by Troy, which is where my parents went. And so obviously I, I had a little bit of like Homer mentality for that just because we knew the coach and everything. I had known the coach, you know, since I was little and just kind of had a little bit of a bias towards uh, being down there because my parents. But then uh, I, I really actually wanted to go to Georgia Tech just because most people kind of in this area were going to Georgia Tech or that was just kind of like the cool thing to do. And I 
wanted to go there. I'd kind of grown up a little bit of a Georgia Tech fan, just as far as I was Georgia Tech over Georgia and all those kinds of things. And so when they told me that basically, they basically told me I wasn't good enough to play there, that obviously kind of changed my perspective on where it is that I wanted to go to school. And the whole Vandy thing kind of, I won't say fell in my lap, but I went up there on a recruiting trip and it I fell in love with it. And it just happened to work out that financially, um, I was going to be able to go there. And I kind of took like a, a leap of faith on myself to go there. I just felt like that's kind of where God was calling me to go. That even though it's, you know, $60,000 a year and I'd come out with, you know, X amount of debt, that it was just, that's where I should be. And it, it paid off for me. Sure. Absolutely. And then you come out of Vandy as a number one pick overall, which is remarkable, right? Tell me a little bit about your journey at Vandy. You know, going from a 38th rounder out of high school to being sort of underrated, overlooked, you go to Vandy, which turns out to be a heck of a minor league play for you, right? <laughs> and yep. and uh, quite a school to the number one pick overall in the draft. I mean, that's remarkable. Yeah, it. Um, you know, it's funny that you're actually bringing this up right now because earlier before we got on the phone, I was signing uh, baseball cards downstairs. And uh, one of the cards that's always floating around is this uh card that it says i think it's plus 1154 and that's basically how many picks i moved ahead from when i was a senior in high school to my junior year you know in college so it's just it's just crazy how um how things can kind of come full circle like that but if i go to vandy and i really think two things that happened i feel like really changed my career there number one was being hurt pretty much my whole freshman year i was I'd broken my foot, kind of just like on a weird play, running running bases, kind of like a freak accident type deal. So I broke the side of my foot. That had me out for like seven weeks. I came back from that. Still didn't feel quite right. Um, didn't really feel like myself uh, being able to cut, take sharp angles and all those kinds of things that kind of had made me me. And I had been having like a shoulder issue on my left shoulder. Uh, so I ended up deciding to get labrum surgery on that you know, after I'd say a week or two after I'd gotten back from my foot things, I was like, I, I can't be effective. And I'm like, I'm not going to sit here and take a spot up on this roster to hurt the team's sake because I'm a shell of myself and I'm not going to take away from the team or somebody else's opportunity to be able to play because of my selfishness to be out there. So I did that. Um, and it really, that whole year gave me such a unique perspective as far as how leadership goes, because I always felt like I was a leader, um, just how I operated, uh, who I was, how my parents raised me to be, the teams I was on. I felt like, you know, I'd learned some tough lessons in leadership along the way, but being there kind of gave me my first opportunity to sit back and observe. I had never done that before. I had never sat back, observed, really understood what it was like to be a part of something that was bigger than myself. And, that gave me the luxury to do so, um, which was so unique and and probably the best thing that's ever happened to me because that year too, our team was one of the better teams that Vandy's probably ever had. Mm -hmm. And also it was filled with senior leadership. I mean, there was the age on that team was a lot older than how teams kind of operate now, you know, mainly now it's juniors and, uh, you know, a bunch of talented younger kids, but this team was, all older and so it gave me such a unique opportunity to see how things are actually supposed to work and so that basically led me to all the lessons that i needed for you know the rest of my career there over my sophomore and junior year so if that was the first thing the second thing i feel like was i finally felt that i was in a place that embraced like every bit of what it was that came natural to me like the servant leadership the um energy and to to your teammates like the the like social bond between you and your teammates and all the different little things that actually make a difference for a team and team chemistry was taken very very seriously like our 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 big thing that we preached there was we didn't have expectations. We just had standards. And and when you kind of think about the wordplay is, is a standard is just, this is how it is. Whereas an expectation is, is something that these are expectations, but you can still fall short. Standards are, this is how it is. 
this is how it's going to be. And this is what we hold ourselves accountable to. And we didn't have any rules. We, the only rule that we had was don't embarrass yourself because that one rule covers everything. You don't do anything stupid because you, right. <laughs> right. you don't want to embarrass yourself. You don't want to embarrass your family. You don't want to embarrass, you know, the program. You don't want to embarrass Vanderbilt. And so if you don't embarrass yourself, then you're not, you're not going to do any of the others. Um, and so I feel like this finally being a part of something that truly embraced me for me just led to my growth as a player um, because the person, you know, was confident in himself. Well, and as a player, you put up the numbers, but as a person, I mean, you're not the number one pick overall in the draft if you aren't the whole package, right? As a person, obviously, and, and as a player. And so then you get to the Diamondbacks and then you get traded, right, to your hometown mm-hmm. team. Tell me about that moment, what happened, and then what, through your, what went through your head? Because, you know, playing for your hometown team, I mean, there's gifts in that and then there's certainly challenges in that, right? Tell me about that moment and, and what came up for you when you sort of heard that news, right? Getting drafted, number one, isn't always just about being a, a talented pl- player. It has a lot to do with being a talented person. And I and I had always kind of felt that that ultimately is kind of what just gave me the edge that year was when you're drafting someone, anybody in the first round, really, but when you're drafting somebody that high, you want them to change your organization. And there's more than one way to do that. And I feel like so many times we overlook that because we just think that it's about who's the, you know, generational talent, which there's not always that in every draft class for any sport, but you start to look at, you know, who's going to help my organization win. And I feel like a lot of the things that I had been bringing to teams since I had been in college and, and since then was this, this like leadership of winning. And so that's what I'd always kind of taken pride and as a person and a player, like I said, I think that that gets overlooked at times because a lot of times we just look for talent and it's, you know, you kind of tend to need the whole package in order to be successful, whether it's, you know, on a field, you know, in the business office, whatever it is, you know, you, you need to be well-rounded on a big spectrum. So, yeah, I get drafted first. I'm actually at dinner with these Nike officials because I hadn't like signed a, a shoe deal or anything like that yet. And so I'm at dinner with some folks from Nike and my phone is like going crazy. <laughs> and the crazy part is so the winter meetings where everything took place was in Nashville, which is why they were there. So for most people who don't know, I spend, I usually, this year's a little different, but I usually spend uh, a good amount of time of my off season up in Nashville, uh, training at Vandy and just enjoying being out of Atlanta for a little bit. Mm-hmm. And so I'm up there. We're downtown at uh, BB King's, some like little blues restaurant. My phone's going crazy, but I'm obviously not going to be like the disrespectful guy. My mom taught me better than that. <laughs> so check my phone right while I'm at dinner. And so one guy gets up to go to the bathroom and somebody else at the table, like check their phone. So I just kind of said to myself, like, OK, just like look to see what's going on, because this is a little weird, you know. So I see a text from somebody that actually used to work at Vandy, uh, was in the pro ball setting. And he just texted me. It was like, is it true? And honestly, <laughs> like that's the, that's got to be one of the worst things. <laughs> yeah, totally. But, you know, just right. saying that, because right. I had no idea what was going sure. on. Sure. A part of me, like deep down inside was like, I feel like I got traded, but I just I, like, that would just be mind blowing right, because right. I just gotten drafted, you know, four months ago, first overall. And then now all of a sudden I'm getting traded. Like that just doesn't yeah, add up. It's right. Especially because I had been told that I wasn't going to be traded. So me being me, like, okay, I'm not going to be traded. Okay. I'm not going to be traded. Like right. it's as simple as that, you know? And yeah. So, right. So come to find out, he sends me that same guy sends me a screenshot from Twitter showing the trade. So I, everyone kind of like looks at me cause I think people kind of starting to catch on what's going on because they're probably obviously getting some updates too. You know, somebody's like, Oh, they're out to dinner with dance me. Oh my gosh. Like, so they probably knew too. So the crazy part as if it's not crazy enough already, my agent, you know, Casey and Vic, this was the off season that Jason Hayward was a free agent. So they had been in meetings all day, kind of like a little bit oblivious to what's going on because, because yeah. they were, you know, they're in, 
yeah, they have Hayward. Meetings. Yeah. yeah. So during these meetings, they even told me they were like, everything kind of like shut down for the day. Like everyone was like, okay, let's figure out what's going on. So the whole rest of that evening, dinner was pretty much over at that point, thankfully, <laughs> because <laughs> I'm like walking in out of the restaurant on the phone, off the phone, on the phone, off the phone. And to be honest, I like didn't know what to say right then. And I was, I was pretty upset because of, it wasn't even as much. I don't think about the hometown stuff. It was more about, I'm such a loyal person and the loyalty component of shifting my loyalty from being at Vanderbilt to now being a part of something bigger myself with Arizona Diamondbacks, I think that's what hurt me so much because I had put so much loyalty into them and it obviously wasn't reciprocated. And so that was like my first lesson in baseball business, <laughs> um, sure. you know, right out the gate. Right. But I just remember that night I actually was able to go up to Memorial Gym, which is Vandy's basketball gym. And I just like shot around by myself for a couple hours. And that's always kind of been my like, uh, like safe haven, you know, kind of like uh, my meditation, you know, reset button. I still just wasn't happy about coming back home. And, and people were like, well, why? You know, like you got your friends and your family here. But in that initial moment, I really didn't know if I was ready to come back home. You know, I, I think at times we all kind of go through a phase where we want to be away from home and kind of build. I want to build a life away from home. To kind of make, not necessarily make a name for myself, but I just wanted to be on my own doing my own thing and, you know, not really look back. And I was like, well, you know, if it was my story, I'm like, I would have had a successful career in Arizona. Then maybe the last few years of my career, come back home and enjoy it, you know, and settle back down in Atlanta. Right. Obviously, the good Lord did not have that plan. <laughs> right. And I just had remembered like my phone, I mirror, I got like, you know, 300 texts, 200 phone calls. And it's like, <laughs> sure. people are, I'm like, this is also why I'm not happy. Exactly. Like, my <laughs> right. phone is going berserk, you know, and it actually has turned out to be the best thing that could have ever happened to me, which it's just crazy how things that we don't understand and that we have a tough time accepting always tend to be the best, most right decision for us. Mm -hmm. How have you learned to manage, right, being in your hometown, the external expectations, the pressure, some of the stuff that comes with that, right? It's been a little, not necessarily an uphill climb, but when I first got to the big leagues, I played really, really well for like the last two months of the season. I played really well. And so I kind of thought that this was just how it was going to be. And then I really got served a big slice of humble pie and I was pretty bad my full rookie year. Uh, I was a little bit better the next year after that, but not, too, you know, I was definitely better that next year. Then in 2019, I was much better than that. And then this past year, I was much better than that. So the the growth phase has taken place over the, la you know, each of the last four years. But I'd say the biggest thing that I've learned about it is how to truly become confident in who I was made to be and embracing who it is that I am supposed to be. And I think it for so long, I had been fighting myself on it and I had lost sight of who I was when I was at Bambi, that kid that had been so mm -hmm. successful, mm -hmm. I had lost sight of who that was. And it took me a long time to kind of honestly build back better uh, as far as who I was and kind of go back to those core beliefs, go back to my core values and just say like, this is who I am unapologetically. And this is going to lead me down the road to success. And I feel like I was even talking to Mal about this last night. And she said the same thing that this was the first time that she had really seen me truly embrace that like all the time. And it made, it made the biggest difference in the world for me. And I tell people this, I say, it's exhausting trying to be somebody else, <laughs> you know, no question. Sure. It's draining. Sure. And, and so finally being able to embrace who I am has really opened up a lot of doors for me. I feel, I feel way more energetic all the time. You know, just every, every little bit of everything that you could ask for, <laughs> I feel like I've been receiving. 
you separate what you do as a baseball player with your identity. And that is really hard for a lot of athletes to do. How have you been able to walk that line? That's huge. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, it's hard, right? Because yeah, totally. ball is life, right? Like that's right. just what we do. It's what we do all the time. And I would say at the end of the day, the thing that's probably helped me the most, and I, I still struggle with it. I feel like a lot of professional athletes do because it's easy for it to blend over after a couple bad games or a couple great games. Like it just blends over. But at the end of the day, realizing what, what I do on the baseball field doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. Like it doesn't matter in God's eyes. If I go four for four, oh for four, when I come home, I'm still the same human being that is gifted with the certain things that God blessed me with. And so starting to like do things more for, you know, the glory of God's eyes versus, you know, just whatever this world thinks of me, I'll take my chances, you know, on the first one. And I feel like just kind of like that peace really. And knowing that kind of allowed me to just do it because if you're so worried about what everybody else is thinking or, you know, performing for a certain standard, then you're constantly looking at the outside world to tell you yay or nay instead of, you know, the person that created us, like being able to do our absolute best to, you know, bring him some glory and to do things of like non-earthliness, then I feel like that has kind of what gave me the peace to be able to do those things so freely and to enjoy them. And whether I go 0 for 4 or 4 for 4, I can still make an impact, whether it's on the field or off the field. Like I can still make a difference. Well, and your level of self-awareness perspective at your age uh, to me is is remarkable. And I know that you spend a lot of time on the mental game, the mental side of life even. What are some things that you do to strengthen your mindset? I feel like this is always my favorite thing to talk about. It's <laughs> uh, one thing that I get passionate about the most. Um, I've kind of already had my own like positive psychology journey, right? Like I've already had... Uh, just from experiencing the lowest of lows, like the things that worked for me. And actually, when I went back to school this summer, because, you know, we didn't know if we were going to have a season, I was taking online classes at Vandy and I was actually taking a positive psych class. And it was, it's a a neat class because the professor teaches you basically, it's like a social experiment, but it's kind of like your own self experiment on all the different ways that kind of build some positive psychology in your brain, whether that's meditation uh, working out, being in nature, gratitude, you know, all the different, all the different things. And I was actually kind of explaining to the class one day, I'm like, listen guys, like I'm 26. I'm older than everybody else in here by at least five or six years. I've already been through this. So I know what kind of works for me. And the things that I've discovered that work for me are journaling is a big deal. I learned how to write in high school. And ever since then, I kind of like haven't looked back. Like I'm always was good at writing school papers, but now it's turned into more of uh, whether it's writing in my, like physically writing in my journal I keep on my nightstand, you know, before I go to bed or like a longer typed out four or five page type thing on my iPad. I've always been good at writing and it's, it's a great way for me to get all the thoughts out on, like to kind of make them real whether they are kind of like some positive affirmation stuff, whether it's things I've been feeling really passionate about or, you know, fueled by whether it's writing that stuff down or whether it's um, something that I feel like God's put on my heart or even I'm struggling with this. I get it out and then I kind of like rewire it to have more of a positive spin on it so that I can constantly be fueling myself with the right things that I want to be seeing. So I'd say journaling is probably my biggest thing that I do. Then the other two things are starting my day off with um, some meditation and like scripture reading. So I, I, I try and do some scripture stuff each day, each morning while I'm eating breakfast or sitting on a bar stool, just read a little bit of scripture. And then I do what's called bilateral um, meditation, which is basically bilateral music Um which I'm sure we'll get into later when we're my, my therapy. But bilateral music essentially is a um, it's music played at a certain frequency that kind of puts your brain at a little bit more of a 
subconscious state a little bit more sedated, if you will. And it kind of plays in a rhythm from one side to the other and back and forth. And then I just do some meditation and prayer um, to start my day because my analogy is if you were to go out and run the race, let's say a 400 meter you know, dash, you would do some type of dynamic warm up to be able to be <laughs> successful for your race. Well, Great analogy. Yeah. You know, if our day is a 24 hour race or 16 hours before we need to get our eight hours of sleep, whatever it may be for you, you need to do some type of warm up to be successful for your day. And for me, I've learned that the sitting with myself and my thoughts and having some prayer and like slowing the morning down and kind of like getting my mind right for the day has been really, really successful. And when I'm in a good rhythm and routine of doing it and kind of like making them non-negotiables that each morning is starting out with this, my days are way better. And when I don't, my days feel rushed. They feel, um, I feel tired. Uh, I feel like just kind of like the days of drag. But ever since I started doing this consistently, it's it's really made a huge difference. And then I said, well, I know we'll get in this, but doing ther- I do therapy once a week. That has definitely changed my life. And you know what's cool is you talk about it. Yeah. Right? Like a lot of people don't talk about it. I mean, you know what I mean? It's like this thing you're not supposed to talk about. I know. And well, because and, and me and my therapist talk about this. It's like the those things that hold you back from talking about it, like – those things thrive in darkness, right? Mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. I, I don't know science that well, but I know that there's definitely certain, you know, there's certain environments that bacteria and fungi and everything are going to dwell in better. It's like negative thoughts, shame, guilt, like all that stuff thrives in darkness. It thrives when you don't talk about it. Because once you do start talking about it, you realize how powerful it is to talk about it and how powerful you are to like overcome whatever those things that are bothering you. Because like it, shame wants to, wants you to feel so bad about yourself for whatever it is that you won't talk about it. But as soon as you do, whoever you're talking to goes, Oh, okay. And you're like, wait, wait, no, you realize this is a big deal. And they're like, no, it's not. And you're kind of like, wow. Like you feel liberated from that. And yeah, I talk about all the time. I'm more than an open book about like my own therapy walk and like why I do it and the struggles that I've had with my anxiety and all those kinds of things. In just a minute, we'll get back to the show. But first, I want to invite you to join my group coaching program, Game Changer Leadership Huddles. My coaching program is perfect if you love setting and achieving new goals, if you are committed to personal and professional growth, and if you want to be part of a community that will challenge and support you. Get signed up today at mollyfletcher.com backslash leadership dash huddles and become a part of our growing community. Again, that's mollyfletcher.com backslash leadership dash huddles. And for our podcast listeners, use the discount code Game Changer to get special pricing. I can't wait to see you in the huddles. Tell me this, right? Take me inside the clubhouse for a minute. I mean, we, we, we you know, the Braves go out. I mean, we're, we're one game away from a World Series this year as a, as a team. Uh, tell me about Snit's approach when you walk out, you know, kind of at the end of the season, right? The clubhouse. And, and how are you guys building off that? How are you building off of that? I'd say his approach and what I think most people love about him is he allows us to just go play. Um, we're professional athletes. We're, <laughs> we're grown right. men. And we know how to hold ourselves accountable for – what we want to uphold, you know, what standards we want to uphold. So I'd say that's a big piece of it. Um, he just lets us do our thing, um, which everyone appreciates. And then I, I would say, um, especially after the end of this year, um, the biggest thing that we all realized and that we talked about that night was you have to go through that. You know, you have to go through those downfalls. You have to go through those experiences in order to come back better. Um, I mean, even, you look at the Dodgers, I feel like they've been close for the last four years, you know, and finally got to that point. And, you know, and we've been close for the last year and a half, right? You know, like we got beat by St. Louis. We got, well, we've been in the playoffs three years in a row. We got beat by the Dodgers, which that year, I think we were all just grateful to have won the division. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then the next year, we were the champs. Like we won the division, played really well. 
and then just didn't get it done in the playoffs. Then this last year, we were really, really good, won our division, one of the better teams in baseball, and we just have to learn. We had to go through that in order to learn how to truly be successful in October, which is way different than being successful in the season. Just like the NBA, there's, you know, the, the game just changes when you get into the postseason. And I feel like we had the right team this past year, but maybe just not the right experience. And I feel like all those things, they have to line up and you have to take advantage. I mean, you just don't get many opportunities to win championships and you just got to take advantage when you do get them. Um, you know, so we'll we'll go out again this next year and work to put ourselves in that same position, and then you know, hopefully come through in the right in the right situations. You know, you talked about how you grew as a leader at Vandy. Tell me about how you've grown as a leader. You know, we have a we have a young clubhouse in Atlanta, right? How have you grown as a leader in the clubhouse in Atlanta? The biggest form of leadership for me has always been servant leadership, but I feel like in order to be that, you have to be yourself, like we talked about earlier, because. Yeah. By me shining my light essentially as bright as I can, I'm then like showing and giving confidence to my teammates saying that you can do the same thing, right? It's almost like a permission slip. Like, hey, you can like unapologetically be yourself <laughs> as well, right? Cool. Like in the more guys that we have on the team that do that, the better off we're going to be as a team, as an organization, because – if I'm operating, you know, 100% myself and so are you, like we're going to get more out of each other. Whereas, you know, if you have whether it's employees or teammates or whatever not comfortable with being themselves, then they're not going to be able to be as productive as they could. Um, so I feel like that was that was a big component. And then I think by building that trust, what helped was then being able to have conversations with one another, honest conversations about one another, whether it's about strategy game plan um even the whole confrontation kind of component where it's like hey you know nobody likes it but you gotta kind of be like hey like we need to clean this up Isn't you know kangaroo court <laughs> we, we, we don't yeah we don't really do those that much anymore okay. um, if it if at all but the whole just being able to go up to somebody and be like hey this is what i've been noticing like just gonna let you know like yeah i think you can kind of like get on get on it a little bit more you know and so all those things come with me being myself and kind of embracing that and like i said being able to build that trust with your teammates it makes all the difference in the world what's your approach to the off season and and, and goal setting and positioning yourself well for for spring training this year was different because we played deeper in the playoffs than we had in, the, in mm -hmm. years past. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that people don't realize that that's always an adjustment process as well because all of a sudden, when I'm used to being done, I have a couple of weeks and then I start back up again. And then I have such, you know, I have three months to get my stuff done. Whereas this year, it's kind of like, okay, after I take all my time off, I only have a little over, you know, two and a half months to get ready. So you start to understand your scheduling a little bit more. Um, I took a vacation, me, Mal, my best friend and his girlfriend, we, uh, all went down to Mexico, got away. Like I was off my phone. The only time I checked my phone was to pretty much play music. That was such a good relief. And then Mal and I actually moved into a house, um, a new house here in Atlanta. Uh, so we had to deal with that whole process when we got back home after vacation. But I'd say for me, the biggest goal setting thing is, I write them down. I write my goals down. Um, and sometimes it's super, super organized, like physical, mental, you know, spiritual relationship. I kind of section them off. Um, then there's other times where I just kind of write all the different bullets down, you know, about who I want to be, what I want to accomplish and those kinds of things. Just because I, I feel like there's so much power in writing things down, put them in the world, make them come to life. Um, you can see it and read it like it's actually there. It's not just up in your head somewhere. But it, it always comes back to, uh, all right, what little tweaks do I think I can make that are going to give me an advantage, even if it's a you know a the tiniest of percentage points advantage for my performance this next year, whether that's physical, uh, mental, you know, whether it's nutrition, whether it's you know all these different little adjustments that can be made, and so you kind of start filtering through what you can do a little bit better at, 
Um, you know, like for me this year, I feel like I found a little bit more of the formula that works for me. So how can I then be more consistent at that? Sure. Because consistency really is the biggest deal for a professional athlete. You know, you talked about Mal, um, who for those listening aren't aware, she's a professional athlete too and competes on the U.S. national soccer team. Tell me about that, right? Like, how does that work? I mean, do you guys push each other, I would imagine, a good bit? And, I mean, are you competitive? I mean, <laughs> tell me about that. Yeah, so um, we are definitely competitive. I feel like in, in any type of, like, game or endeavor that we can compete in, like, it gets competitive. Just because neither of us likes losing. Um, my All my friends and family and stuff are competitive, too. So it's a pretty competitive environment all the time. And so, yeah, you just, you name something that we're playing against <laughs> each other and it usually gets a little bit intense. <laughs> like cards, I mean, right. Scrabble, yeah, like, I mean, whatever, yeah. right. Seriously, yeah, yeah like I'm whatever sure. it could be, I'm sure. it gets competitive. See, to me, what I love the most is like, I don't fully understand soccer and I'm not going to act like I do. And she doesn't fully, you know, comprehend all the ins and outs of baseball either. So you know, if I go to a game and go to one of her games, which is a little bit more rare just because of our schedule, she, you know, when we come home, we just are a normal couple and like in a relationship, you know, I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. not asking her why'd she do this? Why didn't she do that? Right. Like I just, <laughs> right. I'm just there to be supportive and loving and same, you know, after baseball games. And so I feel like that takes a lot of like pressure off because when I come home, even if I'm coming home to another professional athlete, She's not going to then grill me about my performance nor ask me about my performance or, you know, even if I come home and I killed it that day, she's like, she's like, Hey, like, you know, how was your day? Like, it's not like a, Oh my gosh, you're the best. Right, right, right. You know, like sure. it, we, we're just very much normal, loving, giving people. I think that the pushing component, I think it comes out most when, because we don't really work out together. Um, we don't really train together, but I would say it kind of comes in the everyday little things like um, whether it's some nutrition stuff, whether it's just kind of like the pick me up the dishwasher faster, <laughs> like <laughs> the pick me ups as far as like, I know you've been really going hard after this, this and this, like stay at it, you know, just like mm -hmm. little things like that. It's not necessarily, you know, like she's really, really, really accountable and disciplined to her workouts or training regimen. And all those kinds of things. And just by her being like that, I am then better at that mm -hmm. too. Not That's that I'm awesome. not good by myself. Yeah. But you lift each I'm other up. Gonna, yeah. And, you know, like she, she's really good about getting in bed early. Whereas I can like drag on and it'd be all of a sudden it's one thirty, and I'm like, oh, okay, I should probably go to bed. So, you know, she's getting in bed at, you know, 10, like she should be. And, you know, so all those little things really, really add up and help me. You know, and you can ask her what I do for her. I'm still trying to figure that out. Why, you know, why she keeps me around? But you know, I feel like we just really, really help each other. Um, the therapy, and, and and she does. She works with the same guy um, that I do, so that familiarity really helps both of us as well. Just because we can kind of then say, "Hey, do you remember what you know he says about this, this, and this, or whatever?" And being able to kind of like speak the same language is is such a big deal. That's neat. You know, you have obviously an amazing support system, right? You just talked about Mal. And I know both your parents were college athletes. I've actually heard your mom say that she's the best athlete in the family. I, yeah, is, I, I think everybody That's a story I that. tell around here too, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's cool. But tell me this. I mean, you, you're a pretty good basketball player, right? And, and then you, of course, play baseball. What would you tell parents out there listening who have kids competing in sports at the high school level, right? Sports has changed so much in the last... 10 years, 20 years, five years. It's crazy how much it's changed. Like it's, it, I think it's transformed away from kind of even what I know, you know, when I was in high school eight years ago and it's really transformed. And, and just because it's, it's almost like high school sports don't matter as much anymore. Right. It's about your, your AAU team, your, you know, your summer ball travel team, all those things. And, everyone's kind of gotten to this point where they feel that they need to be specialized in a certain thing. Now I agree and disagree, right? Because I think that there's no one way to look at everything. Um, it'd be foolish for me to say like, in which I have before, but like you need to be a two sport athlete, at least like you need to do as many things as possible. You need to be able to uh, compete in all these different areas, but 
that's just not true. Not for everybody, right? I do think it's important to play multiple sports. I will say that. It, it, have experience in multiple sports, especially when you're young. Um, even up until high school, I think it's important because of a couple things. You're learning to compete on different types of fields in different types of sports around different types of people. You know, if you're in baseball, you're going to be around different types of people than if you're playing football or if you're playing basketball or if you're, you know, um, playing lacrosse or whatever sport that like you're going to be involved in different types of people that come from different types and walks in life. And so I feel like that's really important to be able to have diversity in people that you're around. I mean, I think that socially that's, incredibly important so i'd say that's that's a key component but you know there's certain people that you know if you're rj barrett you know and you are going to be uh you know you're just built to be a top five pick in the nba draft as you get into high school it probably would be kind of silly to be trying to pick up you know a skillful sport in baseball right like there's certain you know examples that are a little bit silly but i will say that by me playing basketball it it really, really, really gave me such a unique perspective on competition. High school basketball, I got to play in front of crowds, which then prepared me for when I was in college, and then which has then prepared me for the playoffs or whatever it may be. So each there's so many different little like nuggets in each thing that when you compete in different sports, it's going to give you an advantage as you keep going further down the road. All right, so you got to hit me with it, right? Like, Smoltz, Francoeur, McCann, all these guys with these practical jokes that I would hear uh, constantly are amazing. I mean, to me, it's some of the favorite stuff, right? So what, who's that guy? Is that guy you? And maybe <laughs> give us one of the best last season that happened. Let's see. I, I've i always thought that Darren O'Day was um, one of the better practical joke prankster, just like witty humor guys that i've been around and, and he's been in the league for a long time too so he's kind of like seen it all and and stuff like that but i feel like there's no i mean there's some one example that i can really share <laughs> but i do know that there was one time going through uh there's actually we were going through customs this was a couple years ago because we were going to toronto and just imagine basically telling one of the uh, custom security people that someone had something in their bag. Right. And then when they pull something out of their bag, it's incredibly embarrassing for that person. And they had no idea it was in there <laughs> like that. Like that's the kind of thought process that, that Darren O'Day gives, which is, it's just awesome. It's, oh it's, my it's gosh. just awesome. But it's like, it's like one thing a day, you know, that there's just something small and funny, you know, it's kind of like he pays attention, picks up on something and like he never loses these ideas and just kind of rattles them off you know, every so often. And it's, it's tremendous. All right. So hit us with a little bit on, on all things loyal. I mean, this brand is incredible and what you're doing and how you're using it to serve um, and give. Tell our folks about that. Yeah. So a couple of years ago, I basically came up with this idea um, to tell my own story about why I loved Atlanta so much, like how I, ca how I came to love Atlanta uh, just the different components of Atlanta culture that stood out to me because I didn't think that people really understood how awesome Atlanta was, right? Like, I just didn't think people, like, understood that, you know, rap culture comes from Atlanta nowadays. You know, just entertainment culture comes from Atlanta. The, the amount of movies that are being filmed here, uh, the food that comes from here, um, the other people that were born here, um, you know, and people just people always get baffled when we talk about like MLK and, you know, having such a such a staple component of being in Atlanta and, you know, all these kinds of things. And I just wanted to display that to people that followed me um, and to kind of create this whole like, hey, I know we're from the South and I know that we're humble and, you know, we're not going to just like display how proud we are at all times. But it's OK to show a little bit of like love to the city of Atlanta. And so that's how it all started. Um, and it developed into kind of a, it always been a positive movement, but something to generate some positivity in your own life so that you could then share it to the community, which is why we started focusing, you know, more on things that aren't just Atlanta specific. Now there are still things that are Atlanta specific, you know, it, all things oil literally has it in its name, ATL. That's why we came up with it. And so 
people started to kind of like, we kind of started to show people, Hey, if you change yourself and if you, if you yourself can be more of a light to the world, then you can then start changing your own community, whether it's your community of you and your boyfriend or whether it's you and your family, or I mean, it could be as small as you want, whether it's just you and your household for the time being, the more that you start taking care of the community, the more the world starts to actually change. And so we started basically focusing on uh, being your best self. Um, we run a little line called good energy and it, it's just like, basically trying to promote these things so that you yourself can then take it back to your local community and inspire your local community. And that's why we, we always donate proceeds to certain components of like local Atlanta charity so that we can actually be doing what is it we're saying that we're doing, you know, whether it's giving the kids a chance at life, whether it's, um, you know, just any type of different donations to certain programs that are in the Atlanta community um, to kind of improve you know, the condition in which people live in, in our own communities. So that's where we're at right now. We're actually kind of this whole process of turning it even more so into a business opportunity and, you know, really trying to grow this brand and grow its line and, you know, kind of become more of a, a mainstay in the clothing realm. Uh, my buddy, his name's Mitchell, he is incredibly creative um, and comes up with all these things to basically help people understand the power and believing in yourself, the power of positivity, mm -hmm. the power of, um, you know, kind of setting out your dreams for yourself. So I love, well, I love the, the gear, but most importantly, the cause, right. And for those of you listening, it's all things loyal.com. You know, you talked about therapy, you talked about brain spotting a little bit. Talk about, I know you got a little something up your sleeve you're working on, right? The cheat code. Tell our listeners about this. I do therapy once a week. I've been doing it for about a year now. I work with this guy who introduced me to, it's called brain spotting. And it's basically a tool uh, that therapists are starting to use. It's like a new age thing that therapists are starting to use to help you deal with trauma. And most people are like, oh, I don't have trauma in my life. Like what trauma could I have too? You know, like I'm a professional athlete, but even the trauma of performing really poorly for my whole rookie season or different things that kind of come up in your childhood that you necessarily wouldn't have classified as trauma, but you're like, Hmm, maybe that's why I'm scared to embrace myself because of, you know, when I was seven, somebody said something to me, like it, it's you never know. wild how, how you hold on to things. And so brain spotting is a, uh, we talked about bilateral stimulation earlier. So it's where you have bilateral music. You listen to uh, this music. Your therapist has a, like an old school, like teacher pointer that they would like point at like a chalkboard, right? Like pronounce, you know, these letters and they're smacking the chalkboard. So basically he has this pointer and he moves it throughout different areas of the room um, in which you're, you know, doing your therapy. And you basically stare at the end of the point. And the whole reason, you know, he'll find a certain spot where it kind of brings up a little bit more stress or anxiety and he'll just hold it there. And the point there, the whole reason at staring at the point is your brain's already in a little bit of a seduced state. And then you are only focusing on the end of this point. So your, your brain is like extremely narrow focused. So you start talking about whatever trauma it is that you went through. Um, it's so powerful because the analogy that he gives and that I give other people of what it does is if your brain is a, uh, like a filing cabinet, right? It can get really, really, really overloaded with files and content and things like that. And, you know, if you have a, a Safari browser up on, on, on your Apple, <laughs> right. it's, it's, uh, it's moving slow, right? Like uh -huh, if, you, if sure. you have, you know, 35 browser or tabs open, it's going to move a little bit slower. And so the whole point is not necessarily just get rid of those files, but how to better organize those files to then where you start operating smoother again so that you're kind of compacting that filing cabinet and you are making space for your brain to be able to operate. Um, so it's not getting caught up on those traumatic experiences to where you actually do go through some type of healing process and you're creating these new neural networks and pathways to be able to be who you're supposed to be more often than not. The first time he flew, he, he lives in Sacramento. He flew 
uh, into Nashville. We worked for two days, I'd say a total of about five hours over two days. A, I've never felt so like liberated, you know, wow. in my life. Wow. But the crazy part is like, so we just did about five hours of brain spotting, which was equivalent to about like 20 to 22 hours of regular, like traditional therapy. And it was just like remarkable the difference from that moment till now and doing it each week consistently, like the difference that it's made in my life. Basically, I really, really, really gotten on board with it. Um, Mal has as well. And we're basically in line to do this. There's a company that's uh, created called The Cheat Code. And it's essentially kind of like, hey, this is what us as athletes are doing to gain this edge mentally and for our performance. But the coolest part about it for me is not even just making everyone aware of what is it we're doing and, you know, trying to end the whole stigma behind mental health and, you know, why people are scared to talk about it, you know, just being able to have this conversation itself just so sure. casually right, right. is because for me, like it is that casual now, like, yeah, I, I have stress. Yeah. I have anxiety, anxiety. Yeah. I have this and this, like, so does everybody else. Right. <laughs> you know? And so mm -hmm. sure. um, the coolest thing about uh, the cheat code is, is, uh, there's going to be a nonprofit component to it to where we're going to be able to bring like transformative therapy to underserved communities that don't have those like privileges to get the therapy because it's expensive, you know? And so basically being able to provide therapy for either at, obviously ideally be at no cost, but at no cost for these families and kids you know, that have seen and gone through so much trauma in their lives to basically be able to clear that trauma away and give them like a chance, you know, to be able to be successful in life. Um, so that's, that's the goal of it. Um, there's obviously going to be a, uh, you know, a company side to it where people will be getting therapy and things of that nature, but there's going to be a big nonprofit component to it um, of trying to bring uh, basically these therapy sessions to kids and families to give them a chance you know, really, really serve, you know, our communities and make a difference. And it, it, it really gets down to the root cause for me. Like it gets down to your kids are acting out. Well, why are they acting out? Because of, you know, it could be because of X, Y, and Z. Well, let's try and heal them of X, Y, and Z so that they can actually make decisions that are going to be beneficial for themselves and give them a chance to be successful, you know, down the road in life. Hey, Dansby, you, uh, you've been generous with your time. I, uh, I appreciate it. This is fun. So I want to hit you with some rapid fire uh, before you go take your dog outside, man. <laughs> okay. Um, introvert or extrovert? Extrovert. One word to describe yourself. Ooh, that's a really good question. One word to describe myself. I'll say authentic. Mm, that's awesome. One word your teammates would use to describe you. Caring. Who was your favorite athlete growing up? Uh, no more. Garcia Parra. Really? That's maybe yeah. the Georgia Tech tie there, huh? I, don't, I honestly don't know. I just <laughs> feel like I always loved how he played. Yeah, yeah. Favorite book? I'd say off the top of my head, it's called The One Thing. And yeah, it's probably been one of the more impactful things. It's called The One Thing, yeah. An athlete you'd most want to trade places with for a day? Uh, Roger Federer. Yeah, what a stud. Fa oh, man, he's so cool. <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's so cool. cool. <laughs> I know. He's amazing. What's your favorite ballpark on the road? Boston, Fenway. Really? Mm -hmm. Why? It's just, I don't know. It's, there's just something about the it. history. Yeah, I'd say Boston, Yankee Stadium's cool. Yeah. So there's that monument park out there. It's just like, it'll just do something to you. It's like spiritual, man. It's crazy. What's your walk-up song or what was it last season? I actually had a couple different ones. And before I... It, one of them was called Solid by Lil Baby. And mm -hmm. I only, like, I only It's always a do, Atlanta rapper, right? Yeah. Yeah, I only do rappers from Atlanta. Yeah, that's cool. What was your welcome to the big leagues moment? Uh, I'd say probably facing Justin Verlander. Yeah. He's nasty. Yeah. So the show's called Game Changers. One last question. Who's a game changer or what game changer inspires you and why? Well, I'd say we've already talked about my, we've already <laughs> talked about my therapist. Uh, so I'll say, um, I'd say my dad oh, because cool. I just, the wisdom um, and the such like uh, calming presence 
in his decision making or you know just in his walk in life like just such a genuine caring man how he does it for everybody you know it's not just like people he knows i feel like it's just kind of all the time consistent uh genuine and caring and and wise just a wise decision maker you know and mal says that me and him are identical and so i i hope that i can can someday <laughs> be uh you know that well done bud well done so hey dansby thanks man this is awesome i appreciate it i really enjoyed this That was fun. I love getting to know Dansby a little bit. Here are three of my favorite takeaways from this episode that kind of got me thinking. Right, Number one, set standards, not expectations. You can fall short of expectations, but standards are something that you can always hold yourself accountable to. And rules, the only rule is don't embarrass yourself. Love it. Number two, strengthen your mental game. One of the big changes I've seen over the years is how the younger generation of high-profile athletes, they don't shy away from talking about the importance of mental health. You know, hearing Dansby talk about the importance of therapy in his own life, personally and professionally, pretty powerful. And then number three, find your unconditional support system. You know, I love how Dansby talked about his relationship with his girlfriend, soccer star, Mal Pugh. You know, they, they definitely match each other's competitive fire, but it's clear that, that their unwavering love, support, and understanding of one another is what fuels their connection. Thanks, as always, for listening to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. There you can listen to previous episodes and leave us a review, which helps other people find out about the show. This episode was edited and sound designed by the team at Sound On Studios. You can find out more about their work at soundonsoundoff.com. Check it out. For more about me, visit mollyfletcher.com. Until next time, stay curious and be bold.